Hello, my name is Eliana and I am a children's instructor and research specialist at the Elkridge branch of the Howard County Library System. Welcome to Math Games from Around the World. Today, we will be talking about New Zealand. So here's how class will go. Right now, we're in the introduction where I tell you about the class. After this, I will talk for a while about New Zealand, giving you some basic information about the country. Once I finish that, I will tell you a folk tale from New Zealand. After the story, I will explain the basics of how to play the game Mu To Re Re. Then I will show you a video demonstration of the game. And then I'll say goodbye. That's it. When you registered for this class, there were a couple of files for you to download. Those files contain the detailed instructions for how to play Mu To Re Re and a printable board to play the game. Even if you don't have a printer, you can draw your own board on a piece of paper. The file with instructions for how to play the game also has instructions explaining how to draw a nice even board, but we'll talk more about that later. For now, on to more information about New Zealand. New Zealand is an island country in the southwestern Pacific Ocean. Most of New Zealand is contained on North Island and South Island. But there are about 600 smaller islands owned by New Zealand as well, and they have a claim on a part of Antarctica also. The capital of New Zealand is Wellington, which you can see in the orange circle there. The most populous city, formerly the capital, is Auckland, which is now circled in blue at the top of North Island there. Both of these cities are located on the North Island. Wellington is right on the Cook Strait, which is the water that separates the North and South Island, part of why the capital was moved there. The North Island was traditionally called Aotearoa by the Maori, and that is the name used for all of New Zealand in the Maori language now. Because New Zealand is in the, is in the Southern Hemisphere, its seasons are the opposite of ours. So right now it is winter there, and they are preparing for spring as we get ready for fall. Australia is the closest large landmass to New Zealand, but it is still about 1,200 miles away. Smaller islands, including Fiji, are about 1,000 miles away. Since it's so far from everywhere else, New Zealand was one of the last major landmasses that people moved to. Evidence shows that settlers from Polynesian islands arrived between 1250 and 1300 CE, so a little less than 800 years ago. And those groups developed into the distinct Maori culture that is an important part of New Zealand society. I will talk a little more about Maori culture in a bit. The first European explorers known to reach New Zealand were Dutch and arrived in 1642. But they had an unpleasant encounter with the native residents of the island and left quickly. Europeans did not return for over 100 years when Captain James Cook mapped almost the entire coastline of New Zealand in 1769. You can see the map that he made on this slide here. After his visit, ships from Europe and North America started to arrive and trade with the Maori tribes, as well as to hunt seals and whales in the area. In 1788, New Zealand became part of the British colony of New South Wales. Then it became its own separate colony of New Zealand in 1841. Even though it was a colony, New Zealand was mostly self-governing starting in 1856, and they were even the first nation to grant all women the right to vote in 1893. In 1907, King Edward VII of the United Kingdom officially declared New Zealand a dominion, which showed that it was more independent than a colony. Interestingly, although New Zealand is an independent nation, it is still part of the Commonwealth realms, which are countries that were formerly British colonies and consider the reigning monarch of the United Kingdom to be their ruler as well. So officially, Queen Elizabeth II of England is the Queen of New Zealand. But New Zealanders, sometimes called Kiwis, elect a prime minister who then recommends the person that the Queen appoints as her representative in New Zealand. That person is called the Governor General. You can get a hint of the connection between New Zealand and the United Kingdom if you look at New Zealand's flag, which is on the right-hand side of this slide. The upper left corner of the New Zealand flag features the Union flag of the United Kingdom. 
The other image you see on this slide is the coat of arms. New Zealand is known as a stable and well-governed country, ranked first in transparency and lack of corruption in its government, and all this without an official constitution. Mountains can be found all over New Zealand, including some active volcanoes. North Island, where most of the people in New Zealand live, has rich farmland and green forests, along with those volcanoes I mentioned. It is actually home to the most recently erupted supervolcano in the world. About, two th oh, excuse me, about 26,500 years ago, called Taupo Volcano. The caldera, which is like a bowl that forms at the top of a volcano that has erupted, is home to Lake Taupo, the largest lake in New Zealand. The picture on the left here shows a view of two of the volcanoes on the North Island from having climbed a third one. And the picture on the right shows some Maori carvings on a rock face in Mine Bay, which is a part of Lake Taupo. South Island, excuse me, South Island, which is the larger of the two, has a range of mountains called the Southern Alps with peaks over 12,000 feet. The highest point in New Zealand is Aoraki, also called Mount Cook, which you can see in the picture on the left here. Along one coast of South Island is an area called Fjordland, where steep cliffs border narrow channels of water and valleys carved by glaciers. The picture on the right here shows waterfalls that can be seen in Milford Sound, one of the most famous and most easily accessible fjords in Fjordland. That part of the island, which is west of the Southern Alps, has a wetter climate than the rest of the country, and there are heavy forests covering much of the land. Very few people live in that area, but the natural beauty makes it one of the most popular tourist destinations in New Zealand. New Zealand is home to a wide range of plants and animals, and with its isolation, a number of these are unique to the islands. In fact, almost 2,000 species of plants in New Zealand are not found anywhere else in the world. One of the largest of these is the kauri, a massive tree that grows only in a specific part of the North Island and can live for hundreds of years, sometimes over a thousand. You can see a picture on the left here of the largest known kauri to stand today. It's so big and famous that it even has a name. It's called Tane Mahuta. Although many animals that live in New Zealand now were brought by settlers from other countries years ago, plenty of other animals were already living on the islands before people arrived. Unfortunately, a number of species have become threatened or extinct since people settled in New Zealand, whether from predators they brought with them or from direct human actions. The number and variety of birds in New Zealand is especially noteworthy, and Captain James Cook even noted that the bird song was deafening when he arrived 250 years ago. Interestingly, a number of birds in New Zealand evolved flightlessness, probably because of a lack of mammal predators. New Zealand is home to the kakapo, also called the owl parrot, which is unique among parrots for being the heaviest and only flightless parrot, as well as being nocturnal and herbivorous. So that means it's active at night and it eats plants. Unfortunately, it is also critically endangered, but efforts are being made to breed it and protect it from introduced predators. You can see a male kakapo named Sirico in the center image here. The most famous bird from New Zealand is the kiwi, also flightless, which has become a nickname for people from New Zealand as well. You can see a kiwi that now lives at the Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington, DC, on the right-hand side of this slide. Another flightless bird that has now gone extinct due to hunting was the moa, which was very large and actually had no wings at all. Moa were the main food source for the largest eagle known to have existed, called the Host's eagle. So they unfortunately are also now extinct. But there are many interesting birds left in New Zealand and more penguins are found in New Zealand than in any other country in the world. Reptiles, frogs, insects, and snails make up most of the other native animals in New Zealand. The only native land mammals found in New Zealand when humans arrived on the islands were bats, although many marine mammals, of course, live in the waters surrounding the country. 
A unique reptile called Tuatara lives in New Zealand, and it is the only surviving species of a lizard-like animal that has been around for over 220 million years. They grow very slowly and can live to be over 100 years old. And you can see a picture of a Tuatara on this slide right here. New Zealand's economy is strong, based largely on agriculture and its products, such as dairy and wool, and on tourism. Although it is far from other countries, New Zealand's unique and beautiful natural features and culture attract visitors from around the world. Most people in New Zealand live in cities, although with a total national population of almost 5 million, only Auckland has over a million people living there. And Wellington, remember that's the capital and the second largest city, has fewer than half a million. So they're not very big cities. In fact, there are many more sheep than people in New Zealand. At the highest in 1982, there, are, there were about 22 sheep for each person living in New Zealand. So there were 70.3 million sheep and 3.18 million people. The most recent numbers have come down to about 5.6 sheep per person. On this slide, you can see some New Zealand sheep on the left, and that's a picture of the city of Wellington on the right. Among the people who do live in New Zealand, 74% identify as ethnically European, 15% as Maori, with others identifying as Asian and Pacific peoples. New Zealand has three official languages, English, Maori, and New Zealand Sign Language. English is the most widely spoken language. New Zealand has one of the most secular societies in the world, although Christianity is the most common religion there. Students in New Zealand have to attend school from ages 6 to 16, with free school offered from when children turn 5 until after they turn 19. Schools in New Zealand are ranked very well internationally. New Zealand's culture is a unique blend of Maori and European influences shaped by the unique land. For many years, Maori culture was discouraged, but people have been working in recent years to revive Maori practices and teach younger generations Maori language and traditions. So native culture can be seen in art, especially carving and weaving, with patterns that have special significance to the Maori people. You saw an example of Maori carving on the rock face at Lake Taupo on an earlier slide. Tattoos, especially on the face, are also a distinct art form called ta moko, with special significance in Maori culture. You can see a woman with a traditional moko in the picture on the left here. Sports and games are of course popular in New Zealand, although unlike many countries in the world, football is not the most popular sport. Rugby is king in New Zealand, with the national team, called the All Blacks after the uniforms they wear, the highest ranked rugby team in the world. In the picture on the right, you can see the All Blacks performing a traditional haka, which is a ceremonial dance or challenge in Maori culture. The game we will learn today, called Mutorere, has been played by Maori children for as long as anyone can remember. But before we talk more about the game, I'm going to share a Maori story with you. This is the story of Paikea and Ruatapu. There once lived in Hawaii a chief called Uanuku, who had 71 sons. 70 of these sons were chiefs, for their mothers were of noble birth. But Uanuku had one wife who was a slave, and because of this, her son, Uatapu, was of no importance. One day, Uanuku decided to build a great canoe. A tall tree was felled, and for a long time, his men worked at hollowing and smoothing and carving it. When it was finished, it was painted red and hung with strings of feathers. Then, Uenugu brought together all his sons so that their hair might be combed and oiled and tied into top knots. This was so that they would look well when they sailed for the first time in the great canoe. Uenugu himself combed and oiled and tied their hair, for this was tapu, a sacred thing. When all but Ruatapu were ready, Ruatapu said to his father, 
are you not going to comb my hair as well? But his father said, where could I find a comb for your hair? These combs are sacred. They cannot be used on the hair of people of no importance. Then Ruatapu said, but indeed, I thought I was your son. His father said to him, yes, you are my son, but your mother is only a slave woman, so you are not a chief like your brothers. I cannot comb your hair. Then Ruatapu was very ashamed and ran away and planned to revenge himself. He ate no food that night, but went down to the canoe and cut a hole in its bottom. Then he filled the hole in again with chips of wood. In the morning, all the noble sons of Uanuku launched the canoe for the first time, and Ruatapu went with them. The canoe was a beautiful sight with its feathers and tall carvings, and it went very fast over the waves. They paddled a long way out to sea, and Ruatapu kept his heel over the hole so it would not be seen. When they were out of sight of land, Ruatapu pushed the chips away from the hole and water rushed into the canoe. Where is the baler? his brothers shouted. Quickly, bail out the water or we are lost. But Ruatapu had hidden the baler and the canoe filled with water and sank. Then Ruatapu had his revenge, for all his noble brothers were drowned, excepting one. Ruatapu swam after his last brother, whose name was Paikea, but he could not catch him. Then Ruatapu said to Paikea, which one of us will carry back this news to land? It is I who will do so, Paikea said. I will not drown. I am descended from Tangaroa, the god of the sea, and he will help me. Tangaroa heard Paikea and set, sent a whale to take him to land. So Paikea escaped from Ruatapu on the back of the whale. Then Ruatapu recited a magic incantation and sent five great waves rolling across the ocean after Paikea. But Paikea was too far away, and he came to land just before the waves reached him. The waves hit the shore and bounced off again and went back across the ocean. They rushed over Ruatapu, who was still in the sea, and Ruatapu was drowned through his own magic. But Paikea was safe. It was the east coast of the North Island to which the whale had brought him, and his children's children lived there still. The whale became an island, and you can see it there today. The end. Okay, so now that you know a bit more about New Zealand and got to hear a folk tale from the Maori tradition there, let's talk about Mu Torere. This is a game for two players. And as I mentioned earlier, you'll have detailed instructions and a printable board in the attachments that you downloaded. Each player has four counters. These can be anything that you have lying around the house, as long as you can tell which counters belong to which player. You'll see in the demonstration video that we used white and black glass beads, but I've used different colored beans before, or if you have game pieces that you can borrow from another game, that works too. Lego pieces or coins would also be fine. You can be creative. You can also be creative with your board. The file that you downloaded has dashed lines, so you can go over them with whatever colors you want. You can also add some decoration around the outside, maybe look up some Maori patterns to inspire you. Once you have your board and counters ready, you start by placing the counters on the points around the edge of the board. All the counters of one color go next to each other so that it looks like the two sides are facing off across the board. Then you take turns moving your pieces. Pieces have to move to an open space on the board, either a point around the edge or into the middle. So there's a circle in the middle called the putahi. The trick is that you can only move a counter into the putahi if there is an opponent's counter on one or both sides of that piece. Your goal is to block your opponent from having any legal moves. 
So if you manage to do that, you win. Okay, so now that I've explained the basics, here is a short video of me and my son playing a round of Muto Rebe so that you can see how it works. Okay, so this is Muto Rebe. We have our game board here with our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points around the edge and the putahi in the middle here. So we're gonna place our counters. We each have four. I have white pieces, white counters, and you have black counters. Would you like to put yours on? One, two, three, four. Okay, and you see each color is on one side of the board to start with. So black generally goes first, and you've got pretty limited options here for that first move. Good, okay, so just a reminder that a piece in order to move from the outside to the putahi has to have at least one opponent next to it. So these two pieces could not have gone to the middle for that first one. Okay, so I'm gonna move to an empty space. Oh, that was a short game. I'm stuck already. So you can see that I'm blocked for moving. I can't get my pieces to any open spaces. This is the only one open. So you win. Good game. Thanks. Okay, since that game was really short, we're going to do one more round for you. So you start this time. Make that nice pattern on the board. Everyone can play. You got me again. Nice job. So you can see from that video that this can be a pretty short game to play. Once you figure out some strategy, it might end up taking a bit longer, but it's a great way to take a short break and reconnect with someone else that you want to play with. Okay, so that's all for math games from around the world, New Zealand. I hope you've enjoyed the class and learned something new. If you have any questions or comments, you can send us an email at askhcls at hclibrary.org. Just be sure to include the name of the class. I will also be sending out a follow-up email with a short survey and an extra resource, so be on the lookout for that. And I'll attach the original files to that email as well, just in case you have any trouble finding them. Thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you soon. Bye.